Who needs church? Who needs a sermon after that song? We don't need a sermon after that song. Miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. We're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about Jesus, the miracle worker. Uh, We've been looking at Jesus all year in different ways. We've tried to look at different facets of Jesus because he's more beautiful than a diamond. You know what I'm saying? All kind of ways to look at Jesus, fix our eyes on Jesus. We've looked at the book of Hebrews. We've talked about the radical teachings of Jesus. We've looked at how he lived his life and the practices he followed so we could learn some things. And And today we're starting a new series about the miracles of Jesus. And so hopefully we can not just sing a song that can kind of rouse us, but we can look in the scriptures and, and, and really understand the miracles for what they're really there for. And uh, hopefully we can enjoy this time of worship together and be challenged, I hope. Hope you didn't come just to eat some popcorn and just watch me speak. I hope you come here to get some transformation in your heart. That I'm, I can't provide that. That's God's spirit. That's his word. That's what it does. So, so come ready to, to receive that from God, not from any man, right? So let, let's pray. Father, we believe that you are ruling in our midst. You are ruling in our midst in ways that we can't see with our physical eyes. And we are grateful for your rule and your sovereignty. We are grateful that we are not restricted to believe only that which we can prove with formulas. Father, you have intervened, you have broken through into our time-space continuum in ways that are marvelous and truly awesome. And most vividly, you came to us in Jesus. And we want to fix our eyes on him and We want to look at the way he carried himself and and what he did and what he said. And Father, help us to to leave not just with a heart to to clap and a heart to to point the finger and say, man, Jesus is really great. But but have us, I pray that we can have that humility to, to lay bare our hearts. Maybe our faith is weak or it's a mustard seed right now, but to, to, to know that's okay, that you can build it up. But ultimately, we've got to be people who can take you at your word, that we can take Jesus at his word and have faith in who he is, not just the miracles that he can produce. We pray this all in his name. Amen. All right, today's message comes from uh, the Gospel of John and uh, decided to call it More Than a Healing. I know some of you are singing that song. Was it Boston? It's in your background. Let it go. Just let it go. Get rid of it. Okay. Um, So let's go ahead and and, and look at the text, you know. But but actually, before we look at the text, actually, I saw these quotes and I thought, you know, sometimes it's good to, to set our minds, you know. So check these and see if these relate to you, if you relate to any one of these. Miracles, as the Bible describes them, are not merely unusual events or events for which people have not yet found a scientific explanation. They are acts of God, which dramatically indicate his power at work. This is what miracles are all about. Our challenge is we can be like, man, I was, it was Black Friday, man. It was parking was crazy, man. I was praying, God, hook me up. Man, the dude pulled out. I pulled in. It was a miracle. Eh, no. <laughs> okay? But that's how we can be, man. It was, man, we were down by 10, oh, five seconds. It was, it was a miraculous. Eh, it's not really what the Bible is getting at. So, but you got to set your mind because our culture, we just read, everything's awesome. Everything's a miracle. We got to be careful. I'm just saying we got to be careful with that. If we're talking about the miracles the way the Bible talks about. God has broken into our world and because he has, because there is saving power from outside of the natural realm, there is hope for those who look to him in faith. That's what the miracles were for. They were to confront you with the type of world that we live in. Does your world have room for things that you can't explain? 
And if so, where does that come from? The problem is many people stop at the ooh, wow, and they don't go further. And that's the challenge with the miracles. Jesus dealt with it a lot, and we'll see that today. So we're going to look today at a man who experienced this power from outside the natural realm. And we're going to see what it produced in him. So open up your Bible, turn your Bible on. I'm actually rolling with my phone today. I, I don't usually like doing this, but I don't know. I'm kind of an old school guy. But John chapter 4, verse 46. Let's we'll start there. Once more, he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. And when this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, sir, come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. And when he inquired to the time, as to the time when his son got better, they said to him yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father realized that this was the exact time in which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and his whole household believed. You go, Wow. Well, let's take some time to, to dive in and see what God's Spirit might be saying to us today with this passage. The first thing I want to do is we got to get our geography straight, all right? All right? I got the beautifully designed red lines to help you out, those arrows right there. Those are the two cities we're talking about. The sun is sick in Capernaum, the top city, right? But Jesus is in Cana, the bottom arrow, I read all this stuff. I got 25 miles. I got 20 miles. I got 18 miles. I got 17 miles. All the places that I studied. And then I looked at my little map at the back of my Bible and tried to get the distance and all that. Let's just say 20 miles, just to even it all out. It's about a 20-mile trip. All right? And, and, and the Bible, when it gives you details, you got you to pay attention, right? So he's in Cana, if you're unfamiliar with the Bible, because hey, if you're visiting them virtually, you're here. We love people visiting. You might not have read the Bible. You may not have known what happened in Cana, but you probably have about Jesus. He was at a wedding. They ran out of wine. Jesus' mom, hey, Jesus, can you hook him up? Jesus like, yeah, why are you bothering me? But he does it anyway. Provides this incredible wine. And word got out that Jesus turned water into wine. So he's been traveling. He's been doing his thing. But now he comes back to that same place where he performed that miracle. The same city, right? And so this royal official, literally that word is, is, a, is a king's man. He, he's, a, he's high up. And this dude is, he's high up. He probably had more money than he can do with. Wealthy. He's a king's man. I mean, he's, a, he's got status. When you're sick and you got money, you can get the most expensive treatment ever. You know what I'm saying? You got to imagine he got the best doctors that money could buy. They're surrounding his kid, vials all around his room. Nothing, the kid's not getting any better. Life is slowly slipping away. What would you do if that was your kid? You know how, ooh, and your kids, ooh, I remember Hannah when she got pushed forth in pre K, pushed on the monkey bar, and teeth got shoved up her gums, the teeth flew out. I'm at, the, I'm at the Y, you know, working out. My wife comes, Jeff, Jeff. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, you know, like, what? Hannah, I mean, dude, your heart, my heart. I mean, it's like, oh, my, you know what I'm saying? And then her blood, and then I got in the car, man. I was like, this is not good, you know what I'm saying? Go to, go to the emergency room, you know what I mean? I, it's one of my worst memories, you know what I'm saying? Wow, I hate thinking about it. When your kid is pain and pain, you just, nothing else matters. This guy got all the money in the world. Not one cent can help him right now. He could order everybody around. 
They can't do nothing. But somehow he heard about Jesus. I, we don't know. The text doesn't tell us how he found out. He just found out. Man, this guy, he, he performed some serious stuff down there in Cana, and he's back in Cana again. There's nothing in the text that says this guy is spiritual. We don't even know. He might be Jewish. He might not. He might be. I, we, it seems like he genuinely doesn't have any faith in Jesus he just, as, in a theological, religious way. So he's just like, oh, he's going back to the, maybe that's the, maybe that's the spot where he does stuff. I'm gone. And this is where you got to figure, if he's rich like he is, he could have sent a servant. Go to Cana. Find Jesus. But he doesn't. No, I'm going myself. It's my child. It's 20 miles. You think he's walking? No. He get on a horse or something. Roughly a two-hour trip-ish with a horse. Six-ish, seven-ish walking. That wealthy, come on, he ain't walking. He got on that horse, and he went down there. And when he gets there, I mean, think about it. There's no guarantee he's even going to see Jesus. Maybe Jesus left by the time he got there. If he gets there, how's he going to get, how's he assured of getting an audience with Jesus? And then he's got to convince Jesus. I mean, there's a lot that has to go down. And meanwhile, he left his son, the Bible said, close to death. And you know that feeling when you know, when you know, you know this is, this is it. And when he gets there, this, and we don't, we live in a, what, what is called like a, a culture of, sin, of innocence and guilt. That's one of our things, like the Western world. And so we kind of view the scriptures that way. So it's like the scriptures and culture is about you mess up, you need, you need forgiveness, you sin, you, you mess up. You, you, that's how we process the world. In the Middle East, it's different. Or, you know, in places like that, Asia, it's honor and it's shame. They process things totally different. I'm not saying one's right or one's wrong. But when, when, when in this culture, a royal official does not beg. Definitely not in public. And definitely not to a Jewish rabbi. That's dishonorable. That's shameful. For he, he, throw, he throws away all of his cultural, so to speak, capital. But we don't, we kind of miss that. Oh, yeah, he's begging because he, this is a, he is, this man is, he's throwing it all away. And the word for begging is the same word, it's the same tense, I should say, as when you hear in the scriptures, knock, seek. You know, that's the keep on knocking. Keep on seeking. You know, that, that is a, there's a tense, right? This is the, he kept on begging. He, he, he's just making a scene of him. It's just, the man's desperate. He ain't got no... Come on, man, come, come on, come with me. Come on, please, please, please. Jesus, please, seriously, I know you don't know me, but please, I, whatever you need, I, I, just help, can you help me? I, I, I'll do anything. I, I, can, I can do anything for you. you I, I'll do whatever you need. I can build you a church. I can give you, I can give you a jet, whatever you want. I, I got you, I got you. And then, after all that time, probably rehearsed what he was going to say, this is his response. This is the response he gets. Man, unless you people see signs and wonders you will never believe y'all are like oh jesus that is so rude i cannot believe you just said that that's so rude come on people settle down okay it is kind of shocking to us but again jesus is kindness incarnate he's love incarnate do you know what i'm saying there's no way that what came out of his mouth was meant to harm, hurt, destroy. There's something else going on at work here. Do you understand? And Jesus gets it. But the problem is, he says, you people. He's not just talking to this dad. He's talking to everybody. And what's the problem? The problem is, is you see the miracle and you stop at the wonder of it all and you don't worship. You see the power, but you don't see the person through whom the power comes. 
You just care about the wonder. You care about who? What's the next thing? Oh, man, Jesus, man. That's how the, he, and Jesus, he knows what's going on in the crowd, right? I mean, man, this is Cana, the water, the wine. You can imagine even before Jesus got there. Freddie, what? Freddie, yo, man, this dude is back in town. Freddie, I was working at the wedding that night. I'm telling you, bro, I was right next to the stone container. Man said, put water. I saw the water go in, Freddie. Man said, pull some out. He handed it to the dude. Dude drank, said, man, this is the best wine I've ever had in my life. Freddie, no, it wasn't mad dog. Man, I'm telling you, that stuff was good stuff. <laughs> Freddie, we got to see this man. I'm t- this man is something else. He back in town. He back in town? Man, I'm going to go get my wine skins, man. <laughs> go get your wine skins. Woodrow, wait, wait. get Woodrow too. We're going to go see Jesus. Come on, man. There he is. Let's go. Wine skins flapping. You know what I'm saying? They waiting for the next miracle. They, I know the wine coming at some point. And you're laughing, but you know that's how crowds are. Give me something. Where's the next thing going to happen? Where's it going to pop off? That's how crowds are. Jesus isn't here for that. He's got a short amount of time. He's trying to change people's lives. He's dealing with hearts. He's dealing with evil and sin and righteousness and trying to help people see the kingdom of God. He's not trying to show off. These miracles have a reason. They are trying to produce something in people. But so many in the crowd just like, man, I just want to see the show. (laughs) Faith, man, I I ain't trying to do all that. I just heard this dude can do cool stuff. But, but the, the nobleman, he's hearing that. And he doesn't defend himself. Because <laughs> he knows he came there because he heard. He doesn't defend himself. He doesn't get defensive. Why you? Okay, I came all the Okay, now I'm done with you. You know, I came all the way down. Do you see what I'm wearing? Do you know who I am? Do you know who I'm connected to? How dare you talk to me like that? If you know your Bibles, who does this remind you of? Naaman, come to mind. He wants a healing. He wants a, he wants a production for this man of stature. And when he doesn't get it, he's like, man, forget this. It's similar. But he, but he doesn't go there. What does he say? Sir, respect again. Just, I just need you to get on that horse with me. Just, let's just get on this horse. Just a couple hours, man. I'll buy you a new horse when we get there to send you back. I know you can do it. You just got to come with me on this horse. When I left, he didn't have much time. You know what, sir? I don't need to get on that horse. You haven't told me where you live. I know what your house looks like right now. I know what your son looks like. I know your wife is crying right now, holding him. And I know he's got a fever. I don't need to get on that horse. I can do it from right here. And you know what? I know what a father feels like when his son's going to die. I have some insight into that. I know what you're probably feeling. You can go. You can go. He's doing fine. He's going to make it. So in that moment, what... In that moment, what would you do? You have no proof. Now that we know what the crowd, what happened? Well, he, he just said, he said he's, he's good. Well, he said it. What, what, that's it? He just, man, man, when is the wine going to come, man? I mean, you know, people, but the nobleman. I know, I know, I tell people what to do all day long, man. I got nothing else. I got no more. I, I mean, he, said, he said it. He's telling me. He's telling me. You know what? I, I, I think he's, I, yeah, okay. Thank you, sir. I, okay. 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. Now, think about this. If, if the man rushes to Jesus, tells him, Jesus, I need you. I need you to get on a horse. You need to come to my house. You need to heal my kid. What if Jesus did exactly that? Okay, sir. Gets on the horse, shares his faith on the ride, talks to him about God. Wouldn't that, I mean, that's good, right? Gets to the house, greets everyone with a wonderful pastoral care, helps the child. Child is healthy. Everyone is ecstatic. This is amazing. Praising G, you're amazing, Jesus. After it all subsides, seven and a half weeks later, somebody asked the nobleman, hey, man, I heard about your son. I was out of town. What happened? Yeah, man, I heard, you know, it was amazing. I heard about this guy, you know, and uh, I mean, I just went to him. I mean, I am a royal official, you know, and uh, hey, I, can, I told him what, it, what needed to happen, you know, man, he did it. I mean, it's just amazing, you know, I, I'm grateful. I mean, at the end of the day, that could have played in his, his mindset anyway. Jesus is just another person that just does what he wants him to do. Would that really have helped his faith? Because the miracles are there not to entertain anybody, but there's a reason. There's a reason for them to produce something. Not just be enamored with the power. Not be wonder, woo, wonder, but worship. So, so the fact that he didn't do just what, but no, not only did he not do it, he even came at him a little bit like, nah, y'all just want signs. Kind of like Jesus with his mom, when his mom, hey, can you do something? Woman, why are you bothering me? Kind of like the Syrophoenician woman, right? She's wanting something. Hey, we'll take the crumbs, all right? These moments in Scripture where you expect Jesus just to do it, it seems like there's something that we need sometimes. It's not just a desperation, but it's a grittiness in our faith. It's a perseverance. It's a willingness to go, oh, I, wow, this isn't what I expected. I had, I had a script. See, <laughs> Jesus is supposed to go like this, like I'm supposed to tell you that you're supposed to be all compassionate and you grant what I want and, and you see how my heart's really in a good place and you just give me what I, you know, and that's how this thing's supposed to go down. But, but no, Jesus, no. So something's going on. I think Jesus knows what this guy needs in his faith. Because he would have, the nobleman probably would have just thought he was just another person that he could control. But what is faith? Look at all, we know these, right? It's the confidence in what we hope for, the assurance about we do not see what we do not see. Faith is being sure of what we hope for, being convinced of what we do not see. Faith means putting your full confidence in the things we hope for. It means being certain of things we cannot see. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. You can't see it, but you still can believe. And that's what miracles are supposed to do for you. But here's the crazy thing. He hadn't even seen the miracle yet. But he still got this confidence and conviction. Pretty amazing. All he needed was Jesus' word. Because that's what Jesus ultimately wants. He wants a community of people. All they need is his word, and they respond in faith. Don't forget, we spent a month or two reading Hebrews. That was one of the main problems in Hebrews. He kept repeating the same story. God spoke to his people. His people responded with unbelief. They wouldn't hear his word and obey. They heard his word and went their own way. You and I have the same decision to make day in and day out. Will we believe or go our own way? So here's the part that, you know, again, John, he's, he doesn't have a lot. He's writing small pages, you know, he just quickly. So while he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news. His boy was living. When he inquired to the time, son got better. They said to him yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever was gone. What's wrong with this? This is, there's something massively crazy 
that you have to meditate on. And if you have a small group, I, I encourage you to discuss this. This is where the story gets even more crazy, in my opinion. This makes no, this part makes zero sense. That one word it makes no sense. Yesterday makes no sense. It makes no sense. What time did the healing? At one. Hold up. This man did not walk. There is no way this royal official walked 20 miles. He rode a horse. It takes a couple hours. He gets to Jesus. Jesus, I need to do this. They interact. Jesus says, your son's fine. <clears throat> okay. That happened at 1 o'clock. What happened between 1 o'clock and sunrise the next day? That man didn't go home. Wouldn't you go home? Just at the very least to see if Jesus, what he said was true. At the very least. Or at the very least just to, just to celebrate. To, to hold your wife, to hold your child, to thank you, God. That, you know, whatever you're going to say. But just, and you're only a couple hours away. Even if you had to walk and you were going to struggle with the nighttime, Six hours, if you was your son, make it happen. Let's go. Stretch out and run. Do whatever you got to do. He doesn't, he stays in Cana overnight. <laughs> and I sat there and I, I've, I've read this a million times and, I, and, I, and I, I always try to think there's a great way to preach this. And at the end of the day, I mean, I seriously, I meditated on it for probably 10 minutes here, 15, 30. There's just no great answer for me as a dad. I, I'd have been gone. I'm, I'm sorry. But then I think, it's, it, to me, it reminds me of the passage when it says, don't be anxious about anything, right? But in everything, prayer, petition, present your request, right? To God with thanksgiving. And then it says, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And I think this guy got a precursor to that. That peace. You take Jesus at his word. You actually have conviction and you believe it. You don't need to be scurrying and running and scampering all over the place. You believe Jesus said it. That's, that's good enough for me. One o'clock in the afternoon, my man was like, man, I'm hungry. I'm going to get some food. I think, it, and I can't prove it, obviously, I think it, maybe at some point he probably got in touch with uh, some of the disciples. I don't know. Because at the end of the day, he goes back and uh, he talks to his family and his household and they all believe. I, where'd that faith come from, right? Yeah. And, that, and, and this is the concluding passage because this is, this is John's conclusion. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which aren't even recorded here. <laughs> but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah. There can be only one of those. The Son of God, the unique Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Yeah. That's the purpose of a miracle. Yeah. Not to be like, ooh, that was cool. But to give your full allegiance to Jesus. Your full loyalty to him. Everything you got, even though you don't see him in the flesh. Even though all you have are his words. That's all we've got, right? His words and his spirit that can help us live in his kingdom, which is available to us right now. This was more than a healing. The son isn't the only one that got a healing. <laughs> I believe that royal official got something as well. And I believe the same is available for all of us. So amen, that's all I got. Thank you so much.